true, this is the uh, uh, this is one of the, the missions that we donated to during the uh, Ukraine. <coughs> going on over there. I'm sitting here reflecting on what God has done to prove donors like you over the past year, and I have to say thank you. Um, through hardships, wars, economic turmoil, and, and a pandemic, the Lord has been faithful, and I'm faithful for your faithful. And I'm thankful for your faithfulness to the prayers of giving you help to fulfill the great commission. We're seeing a great spiritual harvest because of your generosity. You helped distribute more than 132,000 Bibles. You helped provide more than 10,000 10.6 million meals. Uh, before, because of your giving last year, you helped meet the tangible need of hungry people around the world. More than 300,000 people were reached with a nutritious meal and gospel hope. You helped reveal God's truth to millions of students. And I could go on. This is where we come in. We supported more than 1,000 frontline staff members and you uh, stood with more than 120. Ukrainian staff members and thousands of people impacted by the war. But anyway, that's a thank you to, to uh, Hamilton Baptist Church for our involvement with, uh, with that. Uh, this is uh, uh, it, Memorial Day is, is uh, tomorrow. Uh, everybody know what Gold Star Families represents? Gold Star Families are the title is reserved for families with of military members who have died in the line of duty. And you've seen, I'm sure, if you're watching any TV at all, um, uh, Tunnels of Tower, where uh, it's a, a fairly recent thing that, that people that have been died or uh, killed in action, this group will come in and they raise funds. I think it's $11 a month or something like that, raise funds. And to that uh, uh, gold star family, someone that has lost a member in the military, they provide them with a home, uh, free and clear. It's, uh, it's uh, built sometimes even uh, by volunteers and things like that, which really takes an awful lot of load off the remaining family. It's tough to see. Uh, Nancy and I uh, went to a, a, a funeral. It was a, uh, it killed in action. Actually, the, the girl was in her way, and it, this, was, this was her son. And in Vietnam, motorcycle team all showed up to leave the casket to the cemetery and things like that. And, but uh, what a testimony he had. He was a, he was a believer, but he left a, a, a wife and how many kids? Two, two young kids, really tough to see. Anyway, Gold Star finally, they're the ones, Memorial Day, that we need to, to keep in mind. And, and uh, we have freedoms because of the, uh, uh, what is that, according to the Military Times article. And not only the ones that are killed in battle, but more than 16,000 troops have died in non-combat circumstances, and even travel or training and all that. And 7,000 have died in Iraq and Afghanistan wars alone. There are thousands of living Gold Star family members who lost loved ones in World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, and other uh, conflicts throughout the 20th and 21st century. And that, that those numbers were just since 9-11, also those uh, people, anyway. It's uh, some interesting things. Some other uh, things. I, I mentioned either a week or two a Brian Gumbel uh, documentary or something talking about uh, prayer and miracle. I did find it. Nancy and I did watch that a, a couple days. It's called God's Miracles. Uh, and uh, it, it's a whole one hour program. And there is a section in there, and I mentioned that this guy took like 20 families or something like that. It was actually 700 uh, patients who had similar, this is a, a, a series of, of hospitals in, in uh, California, similar profiles of people with medical needs. And he took half of those, only by name, and passed them out among churches and prayer groups in the area. He didn't tell the patients. So he had one, half of the patients, uh, that he did not submit the names. The other one, he put names only and said, can you pray for these people? They have medical issues. And he put them on the prayer list. And then he documented the improvements and the results of testing and everything. And they were all comparable illnesses that they were dealing with. And he said there was no question as he watched these reports that were coming back in, or things that he saw, knowing which ones were being prayed for. Anyway, the whole, whole program, it's called God's uh, Miracles. 
It's uh, uh, by Brian Gumble. If you have Amazon Prime, it's a freebie. You just went there and Dow and God's Miracles, Brian Gumble, and it's free. If you have to pay for it, it's only a dollar ninety-nine. If you just do a search, uh, God's Miracles with Brian Gumble, very worthwhile. And, it, and that's just one segment of the documentary. Some other ones, in, in the, he has uh, Benny Hinn and things like that. And that's a stage thing where he touches and the, the lady runs off the stage and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, other miracles that are attributable to prayer and people coming together to pray for people who have issues and things. And there's just no question that God is working. Even when people only know a name, they have no idea the history and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, it, it was very worthwhile. Uh, Daily Bread is on the back. June starts, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? This week, so the new June, July, August, uh, uh, Daily Breads are back on the table next to the, uh, the offering box back there. And then the other thing that we have on our list is uh, June 18th. It's coming up in a couple weeks. It's a men's breakfast. Norm Vaughn is going to be our, our speaker with the, uh, the uh, uh, fathers, sons, men, friends, whatever. Invite someone to come to that and see if we can't uh, have more than the ladies had at their tea a few weeks ago. Okay, okay. that's your job. Larry's a very patriotic character. Well, good morning. Good morning. I, I, I just want to say, there's a, I've been to a number of churches where uh, uh, they don't they prefer that uh, there's no talking in the sanctuary. Before the service starts, they want it to be quiet, and a sacred, you know, uh, just for time for people to reflect and, and, and just meditate on certain things. And, and I always found that uncomfortable. I gotta say, when I walk, I, I love this church. I, I, I came in here this morning and just quickly walked up here, you know, and it's soon, like I open my office door, I hear, like just the, the hustle and bustle going. I walk in here, and it, it was just, it was just, yeah, it was alive. It was just really neat how the, the fellowship, the, the, the conversations, the, the energy going on in here, and that's what makes me go. There's other churches that I know the pastors get annoyed at that. <laughs> but I, I, I praise God for that. I, I love coming here and seeing that. And so you guys encourage me uh, by your love for one another. I just to share that. And also, as David was talking about more of that, I just want to share real quick. Uh, the first uh, more of it was, um, was established as Decoration Day. I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, it was, it was uh, created to remember those who died in the Civil War. Well, just a little, I, I just shared it with you. We always sing uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was written for the Civil War. So that's why we sing that on uh, Memorial Day each year. Uh, uh, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, um, before it was called Memorial Day, when it was still Decoration Day, uh, a year before he passed away, George Patton said, "We sh it is wrong. It is wrong of us to mourn the deaths of these individuals. Instead, we should be thanking God and celebrating that individuals <coughs> like this lived." And, and and so I would think of that on Memorial Day. And I said every Memorial Day since I've been here. At first, I used to be, "Why do we have to say Happy Memorial Day?" until I really truly understood what Christ did for us. And that, that, that the sacrifice that was made allows me to live. And, I, and yes, on Good Friday, we, we remember that. And on, and on, on communion, we remember that. But we remember it in a hopeful, positive way. And we remember it because of what, what it provides. So we don't mourn over his sacrifice. We celebrate at, at the resurrection. And it, what we, if we remember what these soldiers, what these individuals did, and I say each year that yes, we, we should, they, they gave their life. We should mourn for their families today. We should heart for but those individuals, we should celebrate them and not mourn today. But that's why we say happy Memorial Day. So uh, because Christ died for me, I can understand how other people gave their life for our freedoms. Uh, so we're going to transition into prayer time. I thought it was a pen, I picked it up. I was like, oh, that's not a pen. That's a point. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, that's a pen. And I like it even better than life. Thank you, Dave. Now that you steal this pen from up here, that's why you put it. That's what I was going to say. I was like, thank you, Dave. Wait a second. This is my pen you took. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, just to update you guys on a few things. Um, uh, this, yeah, here we go. <laughs> on a few things that we went over in uh, Sunday school. Um, well, I, the first one I see, I, I, uh, Charlie's not here, so I will point here with Charlie's right now. Like, uh, keep Charlie in your prayers. He doesn't have, I, I was told three times, he doesn't have COVID. Uh, you didn't tell me that, but other people told me that. Uh, but uh, he's not feeling well. He's got a cough and, and sick. So keep him in your prayers. And we all know that, that you know, these things can linger, these things can cause uh, frustrations. So keep Charlie in your prayers. And this week, if you could, he does a text. So you'd have to call our home number. Call him and let you know you've been praying for him, you're thinking about him, and see how he's doing. All right, but uh, keep Charlie in your prayers um, today and this week. Um, uh, Caroline, who's the, the Harvey's neighbor we've been praying for, it, it, when you said that she's in a wheelchair. She's in a rehab. But you said she's not even to walk. She has, yeah, she has to have a walk. Yeah, that, 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 that I mean, she seemed perfectly healthy and perfectly fine three weeks ago. And, and so keep, keep Caroline uh, in your prayers. Keep Caroline in your prayers, too. How you doing, Caroline? Uh, Caroline. I know, but Caroline, Caroline, same name. It's just pronounced different. It's not the same. How do you spell your name? C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E, Caroline. Okay. And how do you spell that? Oh, there's this Caroline. She pronounced, she introduced her as Caroline. So whether it's pronounced Caroline or Caroline. Anyway, not, not important. <laughs> but names are important. Let's keep up both Caroline and Caroline in our prayers. Um, uh, we see at the top here, Donna Bowes. Uh, we've been praying for uh, Donna's granddaughter, Dallas. Dallas is doing incredible. She's about 90% now. She's going, she, but she's starting to ask questions about what happened because she's starting to have, she, she's noticing uh, lapses in her memory. She's noticing what I didn't realize. That, you know, so she's trying, and she's learning. For those who don't know, she, this little 10 year old, 11 year old, she might be older than that now. She's probably 10 right now. She might be 14. But uh, this, teenager, she had a brain bleed, and she goes into a coma, and they thought she wasn't going to wake up, and she and it was, uh, we were praying for her, and it's amazing how she's back at school, she's, you know, getting good grades again, she, she's playing with her friends, but she, but because of the couple week ordeal that she went through, it's now, she's now starting to ask questions, so keep her in your purse, keep the family in your purse, but uh, Donna texts me often, Donna goes, that's why I'm really, she's at the top of her head, she's been here often, uh, she wants to thank you guys for your she is overwhelmed. I know how it strengthened her faith and it strengthened her, her daughter's faith, her son-in-law's faith, and, and just the, the, the way it worked in people's lives. So you praying for one another, uh, it's been out of love. But understand, when God hears your prayers, it's strengthening people's faith. It's causing people to grow. Like, I, I can't imagine. I was praying for a, a Paul on uh, this week, a friend of uh, um, uh, Ron Weber's. And uh, I can't imagine, uh, look, I'm sure there was worries and those fears and those anxieties. Praise God, those who pray for Paul doing great, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm sure that changed, that strengthened the faith of individuals who were involved in that. Whether it's Ryan and Carol and Felper, uh, who knows? But as we pray for one another, it shows our love. And we do it out of love, but understand how God's using our prayers to make incredible spiritual impacts on the lives of those in our influence. So let's continue to pray for one another. What else do we need to be praying for each other about? Anything in particular? Jen's grandma in the back, Jen Pinto, her grandma had a stroke, so her grandmother in your prayers. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it, this is what I, and I know it sounds so insensitive when I say things like this, but often, look, I, I say that God controls life and death. So it was it's certain individuals' time to go, and which is sad and devastating. But the family, the family is who I can't. So when you said pray for the family, that's what hits me. Is look, I, I can't even begin to fathom why it was a, a, a little eight-year-old's time to go. That's not my place to try to figure out this in this crazy mixed-up world. But what I can do is my heart can break, and I can pray for the loved ones of that little eight-year-old, and, and and pray that that God can make an impact on their hearts, on their soul, on their eternal hope. So we pray for, yes, the, those who are left behind. And, and I can't even begin to imagine the, the, the brokenness, the anger, the, the confusion. There's so many negative passions that are following after an incident like this. So, 
that's where we do. So let's lift up those who are broken and remember that this week in our prayers. Um, absolutely. Uh, with that said, there's so much brokenness in this world. Uh, today is Jerusalem Day. Uh, the, in the month of May uh, in 1947, Israel was established as a state throughout the entire month. Certain things were celebrations of their independence. And today being Jerusalem Day, there's already been threats and attacks that are going to take place. And we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and so we don't want other parents uh, in other countries feeling like the ones in this country are. And so let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem today and uh, pray that, that God protects that city in Zion. And uh, that... that that yet, that, that those who are trying to cause ill to others, and that it's superseded by the, the grace of God. Um, what else would we be praying for? And I saw a bunch of hands go up when I said before I. Yeah. Uh, will you continue praying for my friend Paul? Absolutely. He uh, heals. And Absolutely. Heals. Good. Yeah, I mean, uh, he had a. What exactly was it? A heart uh, he had to have a valve replacement in his heart. Okay. So he you said, you said heart surgery, valve. so. So that he had a doubt of it, which means there's going to be rehab, which means there's going to be, like, there's weeks uh, of, of, of a process, if not months. And I mean, yeah, uh, look, look how great Tony's doing, so we can pray for Paul. Yeah. yeah, they say that he will be in the hospital for a week, and uh, he will be out of work for at least three months. Wow. While he recuperates. Wow. <laughs> Could you guys imagine that three months of recuperation? How's uh, George doing? He's, he's okay. He's kind of bummed he couldn't get treatment this week. Um, and he won't get it this coming week. He'll get it again. Um, physically, he's doing better. He's walking a little bit more. He's eating normally. He's an absolute So, in that aspect, he's doing well. And uh, for those who have heard, this new form or new approach to uh, chemo uh, has shrunken the, the, the liver cancer. So it, it is working. It's wearing him out. It's causing all kinds of, uh, of repercussion, all kinds of uh, yeah, negative effects, but it's, but it's working. So we praise God that it's working. And maybe that's God's, God's way of making the, uh, the platelets low is giving him an extra week off because it is working even though he's going every other. You know? so, so continue to pray that God doesn't work on him. Pray that, that George can be encouraged through the things he sees, that God can use George's encouragement and, and testimony to make an impact on others through this whole ordeal. So we continue to pray for George and continue to lift him up. What else will we be praying for? Also pray for Casey's mom, Donna. She had her knee replaced on Tuesday, and she was supposed to be in the hospital one night, and she's still in there. Um, they're saying now that she's, there are certain things that she has to do on her own before they can release her. And now they're saying she's too weak to be able to do that. I think they're okay. Um, so now she may be going to a rehab place for a few days or a long before she comes in. So keep, keep Donna in your prayers as she recovers from this. Uh, Ken, how's your mom's knees? I'm good. I went over there yesterday for my dad's birthday. Yeah. She was up and walking around. Praise God. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Did, did, is she able to do the rehab now? Is she going through that process? She's busy, she, yeah. So is she going to be going for back surgery? I don't know, eventually, I don't know okay. when. I think we still got a while, right? Okay. We'll continue to pray for Kevin's mom. And there's so many of us, whether it's backs or knees or... <laughs> Look, the meet and greet, you guys have 180 seconds. Go find out who needs prayer about what. <laughs> because there's so many of us who, are, who have aches and pains and who are just... Like uh, Karen. Karen uh, is now, like, you're, the way you're limping, it's like, Karen, like, when did that happen? And, Keep Karen's knees in your prayers, and, and, and there's so many of us who are hurting. So, you can use it. Yeah, well, we're talking about knees. Uh, our doctor, Dr. Di Maria, he had knee surgery last week, huh. and he's supposed to come back part time this week. And he is on ministry, too, at my title. And everything. Just keep him in prayer, too, because he's a good friend. And, uh, Kathy and I have been on our show for a Yeah, absolutely. Continue to keep Kathy in your prayers. Just, just yeah. And, and pray for those who, I mean, I'm sure there's people here that, that are affected by that, who, who've been friends with her, a loved one of hers for, for decades. So continue to, to pray for Kathy and, and those, 
those in her life. Any, uh, anyone else? Anything else? How you doing, babe? Yeah. Praise God, baby. All right, let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this body of believers that you have brought together and that you've instilled into us your spirit and your love, your joy, your, your, your gentleness for one another. Lord, we pray that you strengthen your spirit within us and continue to have us reach out to one another, pray for one another, lift one another up, comfort, encourage, strengthen one another, sharpen one another. Father, use us to strengthen and to build this body. The gifts you've given us, the love you've given us, Father, we thank you for it. We pray that you use us now. And whether it's this week who needs prayer, who needs a phone call, a text message, lay it on our heart and help us to, uh, to, to continue to follow, seek your kingdom and seek your righteousness as we love and lift up one another. And we thank you for this time. I thank you for these the individuals who have a love for one another because of your love. Lord, we thank you that we have the right to be called children of God and the love that you bestowed on us. Use that love to strengthen this body. We thank you. Lord, we thank you. We pray you continue to strengthen your strength in us. You continue to use us to do your bidding, to do your will. And Lord, we pray that, that, that as you use us, that we can see the influence of your spirit. We can see your love, the impact of your love throughout, in, in our spirit influence, in our homes, in our places of work, in, in, in the these your places and Father, use us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit continues uh, to reverberate. The, the power of your Spirit continues to change lives through us. And we continue to give you the glory for it. We thank you. Lord, put your hand upon this body now. And this, this service, and as, we, as we comfort, as we go on another, pray for one another, as we sing songs, as we give gifts, as whatever it is we do here this morning, we pray that you take glory, honor, praise from all that we do. Allow us to exalt your name. Allow us to bless the name of Jesus this morning. We thank you. So take joy from now in the Bible Church, Lord, as we worship you. And Lord, we thank you for the freedoms we have. Lord, we thank you for this country. We continue to pray for our elected officials. We continue to lift them up in, in your will. And Lord, we pray that you continue to make an impact on them. Draw them close to you. Their need for salvation. Convict them of their need. And help them make decisions according to your own word. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you continue to do work on us and here now and in our home. Continue to allow us to be an extension of your love. Continue to allow us to seek your kingdom and lift you up as we seek your righteousness. We thank you. We thank you. So bless this time. Bless each person here, Lord. Draw us into your presence and take joy from us as we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys have three minutes. Go get
looking for a new pastor. And uh, uh, they had a bunch of candidates come in and, and speak and, and audition. And uh, uh, this one man comes in and he just preaches this powerful message. It's a, it moves the people. People are just enthralled with the, with his, with the words. And, and, and just they just see the power. And see, he was just firing. And they're just they're like, this is the man. This is the man who got, this is what we need for our church. This is the man. Uh, so the, they, they quickly just, the entire church just convinces the congregational, uh, the, the, the search committee, and they hot, they just go out and hire this man. They don't bring him in again. They just hire him. And he comes, his first week, he gets up there, and he preaches a powerful sermon, fiery, touches hearts. But they're like, that sounds familiar. It was the same sermon he preached a couple months earlier. The next week, week two, he comes back, and he comes in and preaches a powerful sermon, moves people, changes her, but they go, wait a second, that's the same sermon. And week three and week four, he preaches the same sermon each week. So finally, a bunch of the congregation get together, they go, we've got to talk to the elders and the deacons. So they get the council and sit before them, and they go, this new pastor, he keeps preaching the same sermon each week. And then one of the councilmen goes, what was it about? And someone goes, I don't remember. What was it about? And then he asked the people who were complaining, he goes, so what was the sermon about? And they go, well, I mean, I don't remember specifics. And one of the men says, let him preach it again. <laughs> I think as many laughs I thought of. Maybe she would smile. <laughs> but uh, some sermons have incredible impacts, and some sermons are easily forgotten. What's interesting is we're going to look at a sermon this morning that most of us probably didn't even know was preached. <laughs> and we probably, not, many, many of you might have forgotten. We don't even see it in here. It's actually the only sermon we ever get from the Apostle Paul, and we're going to look at it this morning. Now, uh, bear with you, we're going to, before we get into it, we're going to pray. Before we, do, I want to warn you that we're going to read the entire sermon. Which means we're going to read 28 verses, and I know how I used to get when the pastor would read too many passages, too many verses at once. I would start drifting off and thinking about other things. So then, once he started talking again, my mind was gone. Try to stay with me while we read these many verses. Either read along or read it in your the Bible. But uh, we're going to read 28 verses this morning. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sermon of the Apostle Paul. Before that, thank you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the very oracles of God that we can grow from, learn from, the, 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 these facts of history, but these facts that are true and, and, and powerful. And we pray that you speak to us this morning through your word, through your Holy Spirit. Father, speak to us, not, not my words, not what I have to say. Speak through me, Father, as you speak to each one of us. Each one of us is at different places. We need different things. So, we pray that you speak internally to each one of our souls. So as I'm rambling externally, you speak to us. Not my words, not my will, but yours. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's speaking to us now. And we pray that you continue to strengthen us through your word this morning. And we thank you for it all. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week, or over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Paul's, uh, we watched Paul and Barnabas go on what was referred to as Paul's first missionary journey. And we see, I don't know if you want to pull up the, uh, um, the, 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 the map. Again, that would have to be used by the cool little pointer. Just so they, they left Syria and Antioch, and they put that little like this thing. This is awesome. And they traveled to Cyprus. They went through the whole island of Cyprus, and then they went up to Perga. And in Perga, that's where uh, John Mark abandoned them or deserted them. Some of you are really enjoying how I'm enjoying this. I can see it. That's too funny. But uh, uh, in Perga is where John Mark left them. John Mark abandoned them, and he went back to Jerusalem. And we talked about the challenges and that not only John, the loneliness and uh, the discouragements that John, but also the challenges that Paul faced on his many missionary trips, or many missionary journeys. And here, from uh, as they traveled from Perga up to Antioch, Pisidian, uh, we, we we talked about how that uh, they go from sea level to 3,600 feet above sea level in those 150, 200 miles. And also those 150, 200 miles, were, those roads were filled with robbers and burglars and bandits and thieves, oh my. And they were just, it was, it was, it was a terrible uh, ordeal, a terrible situation, and they endured it. 
They persevered through it. And we talked about the trials. That, you know, each one of us has been called for a purpose. You might not all be missionaries traveling the world. You might not all be preachers and teachers. But each one of us is called. And whatever your calling is, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be struggles. And so often we see the challenges, we see the trials, and we run. But here, they embraced it. And when they got out to Antioch in Pisidia, we see that, that they, the first thing he did was he went to synagogue. That's what Paul did. He'd go to where the Jewish people all offered the Jews to, to God, to the Jew first. But also, that's where the God-fearing Gentiles were as well. So he goes there, and we talked about that. Even though there might be challenges, even though there might be struggles, even though we might fix all these trials, if God is at work, God's going to open the door. And we see here that while, they, they, that while there, uh, even though there were challenges getting there, even though there were trials and Mark aban uh, abandoning them and, 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 and the, the, the robbers and the, all the challenges that they faced, they get there and God opens the door. And while they're reading the, the, the weekly uh, Torah reading or, or reading from the, the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue official turns to Paul and says, Ask them, then do you have a word of exhortation that you would like to share? He asked Paul if he would like to preach. And, and this is so significant. And, and, and I just mentioned casually a minute ago why it's so significant. But I want us to understand that Paul the Apostle had wrote, the reason we, look, most of our doctrine, most of our teaching, most of our faith, the, the uh, foundational aspects of our faith come from the writings of Paul the Apostle. They come from his teachings, his letters. He wrote 13 letters to the, he, he's, to the number of churches he founded. Someone, we, we, over a dozen churches that he founded. He writes 13 different letters to these letters. He, we see that he spent uh, many, many years traveling to these churches. We're going to look at his first, second, and third missionary journey. We're going to see the thousands upon thousands of miles that he traveled and the churches that he founded, the preaching. We see in Acts chapter 17 the speech that he makes at Athens uh, to the men of Athens about, uh, and then we see in, in Acts chapter 20 the speech he makes to the leaders in, in Ephesus, and the elders of the church in Ephesus. But all of his teachings, all of his travels, all of his writings, all, all the documented history of Paul the Apostle, this is the only sermon we see him preach. This is it. This is all we get. This is all Luke gives us. This is the only insight into Paul preaching the gospel. The man is the one who coined the term for us, the gospel. And here we see he's preaching the gospel. So let's, uh, let's look at what he has to say. He stood up and, and the man offered him an opportunity to speak. You men have a word of exhortation. And with that, Paul stands up and he stood up motioning with his hands. See, he's Jewish. And it's probably just, look, and the reason he motioned with his hands, it was probably in two, two parts, because I do this often. It's one, to get everyone's attention. Men, men of Israel! And he wanted to get everyone's attention, but at the same time show the significance, the importance of what he's about to speak. If I do this, it seems like I'm about to say something important, right? <laughs> you know, instead of just going, uh, men of Israel, let me, no, men of Israel! So he motions with his hands to show the significance of what he's about to say, and, and now you have to bear with me. He says, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out, of, out from it. And for a period of 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. And after these things, he gave them judges until Samuel, a prophet. And then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. Concerning whom he also testified and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who would do all my will. From the offspring of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. And after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was com completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me whose sandals and feet I am not worthy to untie. Let's stop right there. So, look, I'm not going to start uh, uh, criticizing or nitpicking another preacher's sermon. All right? That's not my style. All right? But what? Uh, but, uh, but what I want to do is look at what we can take from this. What can we take from it? So this is the first half of Paul's sermon. And what we see is Paul starts off uh, with some history. 
I love that. I love that he starts off with a, explaining the context and explaining the history behind what he's proclaiming to them. And uh, uh, we see this, uh, uh, Peter does a similar thing at Pentecost. We see Stephen do a similar thing uh, in front of Sanhedrin. And someone mentioned to me last week that we see Josh do a similar thing almost every week that I get up here to start off with a little contextual history. And I love it because, it, but, but one thing we see Paul do, and his history is so much more significant, what he says is he shows how Jesus, or the Messiah, is the centerpiece of Israel history. He, uh, he talks about how them in slavery in Egypt and, and God freed them and then traveling through the wilderness and then entering into the land, 40 years in the wilderness, going into the land all, all that time to 450 years, towards slavery, 40 in the wilderness, 10 years of conquest. And then they come into the land and they spend 350 years in the time of judges. And then as the, at the time of judges, they come and Samuel issues in the kingdom with Saul and, uh, and David. And all these things are pointing to the descendants of David who is the Messiah. All of Israel's history points to Jesus. How cool is that? Uh, to me, there's just something so significant about that because well, I've said this many times up here and I've said this many times at Sunday school and, and, and on Thursday nights, but it, it, it's so sad that the Jewish people, uh, they, the, their whole history, the, their culture, their customs, if you pull Colossians chapter uh, 2, in Colossians chapter 2 it talks about that, uh, that a new moon festival or a Sabbath day or, or all these holidays, there's no one to act as a judge uh, to food or drink or respect the festival or new moon or Sabbath day. The things in which a shadow to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Every one of their holidays, their cultures, their customs, their, their rituals, their traditions, all that they do, all point to Christ. But they don't see it. They don't see it. Look, many of you got up here with the uh, communion. We see that in the Passover, it's pointing to Christ. And we can see how it, 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 the, the, the first fruits or the Sabbath or the rest and all it's provided. All these things are pointing to Christ. Their whole tradition, their rituals, their culture, their history points to Christ. They don't see it. We see it. But what does our life look like? See, I thought I was one who made God the center of my life. I thought I was had a focus in um. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing, or pray continually. And I thought it was something that I did, having God in the forefront of my mind, praying continually, praying without ceasing. It was my focus. It was all, and I think some of you probably think that you do that too, but I realized this week how there's a different level to it. I realized on Thursday how I'm doing in a week. Wait, my wife knows where I'm going with this. Because on Thursday night, <coughs> my dog, our dog, Annie, got sprayed by a skunk. I know. And if that's ever happened, then you know what focus is. Because there's nothing happened. I have not gone three minutes in the last four days without thinking about a skunk smell. And then, like, I was just in bed, I was like, do I smell it? I walked into Walmart the other day, I smelled it. I went to the cash, the lady at the, uh, the breeder, I said, do I smell like skunk? Just sniff it. You know, and I'm asking strangers to sniff me on the streets. I pulled in the gas station. I rolled down my window. Didn't smell the car. I smell skunk. I asked out the gas station. I'm like, do you smell skunk? He's like, no, I'm like, good. Okay, and, but I, everywhere I go, everything I do, I can smell. And it's my focus. Even when I don't smell it, I'm thinking, do other people smell it? Do you smell it on me? Do you, why are you not? Do you smell it on me? Like, and I, it's all, it's my focus. It's all, and I, I mentioned this to, to Crystal, how I was going to use this as an analogy, <coughs> saying how, how we need to be praying without ceasing. We need to be focused on God. We need, everything we do, our, 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 our focus, our, our intentions, our attitude, uh, the, the, uh, the, our actions, our lifestyle, everything needs to be inundated with God and with his word. And that needs to be our focus. And she goes, well, now you're comparing God to the odor. And, and she goes, I don't think that's good. I don't think you should compare God to the odor. And I said, no. That's, the, that's where you're wrong. That's the mistake you make. See, the odor is the problem. More ways than one. <laughs> the odor is the problem. The problem is, is instead of focus on God, there's other stuff. The odor becomes our finances, or our finances become the odor, and our, the odor, our, our, our relationships become the odor, and our jobs become the odor, and our recreation, and our chores, and, and all these other things become this odor that inundates our life, and, our, and it's where our focus is, and where our attentions are, and it's where our attitude is, and we, and we neglect what God should be the focus in our life. Everything we do should be running through Him, and, and our attitudes and our a, a, a efforts and our actions and all should be inundated and running through Christ. 
See, the Jewish people, their whole life, their, the way they dress, the way they eat, the way they function, the way they worship, all that has to do, and all that points to Jesus, and they don't even know it. We claim that everything that we do is about Jesus, but yet we get caught up in all these odors, all these things that are filling our nostrils that are unnecessary. And, and see, I, I put a, I can find my notes. Uh, I put in here Joshua 1.8. I always put 9 for a reason. I'll tell you that in a second. But Joshua 1.8 says, the, this book, the law of the church, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you be careful to do a call according to the written For then you will be, make your way prosperous and successful. Meditate on the words of the Lord. Dwell upon it day and night. And if you be careful to do all that's written, then you will be prosperous and successful. See, this idea of meditate is not just to think about it and go, oh yeah, that's good. No, it's to dwell on it. It's to let it engulf you. It, 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 let, let it become your personality. Let it become part of your character. Let it become part of who you are. And let it engulf your, your, your psyche. And, and then we dwell on these things. And then we apply them. And that should be our focus. And then we'll be prosperous and successful. The second part of this, have you not have an opportunity to be strong, courageous, and not strong. Do not just be the Lord of God with you wherever you go. The reason I put that there is because we uh, we now have a nursery. <laughs> and this uh, it, it's, it's officially a nursery because there's a crib in it. Okay? Um, thank you. Put it together myself. <laughs> I, I shouldn't brag about that. The kids fall through from night one, so <laughs> I'll wait to see if he makes it through the night. But we have in our nursery on the wall uh, is this verse, Joshua 1 9. Joshua 1 9. And uh, the, my thoughts there is, uh, is because I want to create a culture in our home. I want to create a, a culture where, where God is the center. Where the, the things we do, the things we focus on, the things we talk about, the things that we put on our walls makes G is Jesus is the focal point. See, when it comes to Israel history, Jesus is the focal point. But when it comes to our life, is he? Or do we have other things filling our nostrils? other things that are taking our attention and other things that are preoccupying our focus. And, and, and that's the first thing I get from Paul's sermon here, is that, is that yes, he's pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, he's showing that the salvation, where, and that where it comes from, and we'll get to that in a second, but one thing that is that Israel was welcoming a Messiah with their history, and they were waiting for him, and it's all their history, all their, ad, all their and whatever they do, points Jesus. Um, if we go back to that thing. Uh, then he continues and he says, verse 26. And he, he continues in verse 26 where he says, uh, uh, Brethren, sons of Abraham, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, talking to the Gentiles as well, to those, to us, the word of the salvation is sent out. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers recognize neither him nor the utterances of the prophets which they read every Sabbath fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground in putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed in the name they carried out all that was written concerning all that was written concerning him. They took him down from the cross and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who were now who are now as witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled the promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus as is also written in the second psalm, thou art my son today I have begotten you and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to decay, he spoke again in the psalm I will give you the, uh, this is Isaiah I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, therefore he also in, in another psalm said thou will not allow thy holy one to undergo decay for David after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation fell asleep and he was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is free from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Free through his sacrifice that you could not be freed from the law of Moses. And then he says, take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken in the prophets may not come upon you. Oh, you scoffers and marvel from a parish, for I am accomplished in a work in your days, a work which you shall never believe if someone should describe it to you. 
He starts off, uh, he finishes the first section that I have to stop, talking about John the Baptist. The reason Paul emphasizes John the Baptist is because the Jewish people believed John the Baptist was a prophet of God. Now, some Jewish leaders will question it because John pointed to Jesus. So if you believe John's testimony, then you should believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And, he pointed, and they, these people believe John's testimony. So he said, look, if you believe John, look, John points to Jesus. But he goes even farther. See, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, <laughs> Jen knew exactly where I was going with this because she I thought it was the 1 John chapter 5 says, but we believe the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testament of God that is testified concerning his son. And so often we believe what people say. We believe what we feel. We believe our opinions. We believe the testimony of man. But these Jewish people and these God-fearing Gentiles, they believe God's word. They obey the Torah. They, appro they, they, uh, they apply and practice the law. They should believe the testimony of God over the testimony of man. And that's why Paul starts off with John the Baptist, the testimony of man. But then in the next section, he lists off Four passages of scripture. Over and again, quote scripture, quote scripture. Three times he says, it was fulfilled, it was fulfilled, it was fulfilled. And we see this idea that Paul emphasizes the significance and the importance of the word of God. My question to you is the word of God, is the word of God an authority in your life? Now we all go, absolutely sure. But we were talking about in Sunday school, uh, the book of Jude. I'm not trying to. Now. But uh, we were talking about Jude and going through the next week. We're going to finish the book of Jude. So if you come to Sunday school, we did Jude this morning, and we're going to finish Jude next week. But in Jude, Jude is uh, talking to the, the about these false prophets, these false teachers who are teaching things based on their opinions, based on their natural instinct, based on their feelings, based on dreams, based on visions that they had, not based on the word of God. And this is what they're teaching to the people. And so often I found we believe those things. We believe the things that we feel. I, I, I mentioned this in Sunday school. Someone asked me to, uh, uh, to officiate the, their, their wedding. And uh, I told them I couldn't because I didn't agree with certain things. And they said, I said, I didn't agree with the matter. I didn't agree with certain things. And they said, well, I believe God will want me to be happy. And that's so often how we think that, that, that it, 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 we have feelings. We have opinions. We have my perspective. I have my desires. And God will want me to be happy. So instead of obeying God's word, instead of making God's word authority in our life, our feelings and our opinions become an authority in our life. And we disregard God's truth. We do it all the time. I feel so, so my question to you is, when your opinions and your feelings don't match up, contradict God's word, what do you change? Because so many people, so many of us, try to change God's word to apply to our feelings. So many of us try to change God's word to fit into my opinions and my perspective. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to change our thinking, change our feelings, change our opinions to be, to can be congruent with God's word. And far too often, we try to change God's word. And, and, and that's why Paul emphasizes the importance of the scriptures to these individuals. Because these are individuals who are following the law, following the Torah, following God's prophets, following the teachings. And if they're making that their life, then Paul should say, well, look, if that's what you believe, then here's the truth. And so often we go, this is what I believe. This is what I feel. I'd rather stick with what I feel than follow the truth. So that's what Paul, so Paul closes out his sermon with this idea of God's word being true, the, 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 the authority of God's word. And the people hear it, and the people follow. The people follow them. The people are moved by them. And I had a cool little story here, but I'm running low, so I'll, I'll move on. But uh, So uh, go back to uh, Acts in the 42. Yeah. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, so now the synagogue, he's finished his sermon, the synagogue's over, so going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them. The next Sabbath, so next week we'll talk about the next Sabbath, but now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and God fearing proselytes, like those who converted to Judaism, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. How do they, they urge them to continue in the grace of God? This is so telling, uh, the idea that they urge them. What does it mean to continue in the grace of God? 
grace of God? How do we continue in the grace of God? And uh, so when we hear this term, one of the first things we think is that, uh, well, at least the first things I think, is in Galatians it talks about this idea, you don't pour up, because it's not the first one I'm talking about. <laughs> but this, in Galatians it talks about the idea of falling from grace. So we think that we fall outside of God's grace. And But understand who he's talking to here. He's talking to Jewish people who, who believe that salvation comes from the law. He's really talking to Jewish people who believe that they have to apply these works and these practices in order to receive God's, God's uh, grace, in order to receive God's blessings. So he's saying, no, look, you just learned that, that it's by grace you've been saved. In Ephesians chapter 2, you pull that on. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of the works, it's not of ourselves. And, and we think, learn this. And, and then Paul leaves that and says, look, you just learned that it's by grace you are saved. Continue in that grace. Don't go back to works. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to thinking that you have to earn something. Don't go back. Uh, don't go backwards. Continue in that grace. You see, in uh, in, in Galatians, uh, when these individuals uh, uh, began thinking that they could work themselves into favor with God, even though they they got saved through faith and they got saved through His grace, they started thinking, "I have to keep the law. I have to get circumcised. I have to uh, do these lawful practices in order to." win favor and earn favor with God. So uh, he says uh, in Galatians chapter 3, this is, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Galatians 3, 1 says, who has bewitched you? And he says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? So they knew that they got saved through the Spirit, but now they're trying to earn it through doing the right thing and thinking that it's through works. We do the same thing. We come to Christ knowing that we get saved through grace. We know that it's no works of our own. But then we start, once we get saved, we think, well, maybe I can earn a little favor here. And, you know, if I, if I come to church, then God's going to bless me. If I do this, then God's going to bless me. If I do this, and we tend to think that now we can start earning. No, you came through grace. You were brought in through grace. You were saved through grace. Don't think you're going to now going back to works. Continue in grace. Continue in grace. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us an understanding and insight into what this looks like. He says, um, he, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more uh, than all that. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. See, God has given us gifts and abilities, and it's not us who's doing it, it's the grace of God. God has given us gifts, and we continue in the gifts that He's given us, continue in the grace, continue with the blessings that He, so we serve one another, and we love one another, and we sacrifice ourselves for one another, because that is the grace of God that's given us the strength to do that for one another. Don't think that you're earning it, no. Don't think that you're serving one another by earning salvation, any kind of favor, no. We're doing that because we're continuing in the grace of God. I still am annoyed, if I think about it, about the Eagles playoff game last year. Yeah. I'm still annoyed. Here's why. Does anyone know what the Eagles were the best at all season? They were the best rushing team in the NFL. They threw the ball more than they ran it in that playoff game. There's a saying in sports, and I think it has to do with our Christianity as well, because sports is life, first of all. <laughs> look, everything comes out of sports. Look, I said this story many times. Everything's in sports. Emotions and bitterness and jealousy and success and all that can wrap up, even all the drama of life, it comes in one little sports package. And at life, sports is life. And here, look, you go with what got you there. Right, Tony? You run the ball with your best friend, team in the league. You get to make the playoffs. You got to the playoffs because you ran the ball. You go with what got you there. The reason we're sitting here as children of God was because of the grace of God. Don't think you can start earning it now. Go with what got you there. We're here because of his grace. We're here because of his mercy. We're here because of what he did for us. Don't think it's because of favor that we can earn and work ourselves towards. Continue in the grace. Unlike the Philadelphia Eagles, my, my advice to you is go with what got you there. Continue in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. 
Lord, we thank you that we've been called to your name. We thank you for your love, your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that strengthens us, corrects us, guides us, con convicts us, and conforms us to the image of your Son. Continue to conform us to the image of your Son. Continue to strengthen us. Continue to use us, Father. Help us to seek your kingdom, your righteousness, not our will, not our ways, not our opinions or feelings, your word, your will. Help us to see your kingdom. Seek me first. Your kingdom. Oh God, we thank you. We praise you. Continue to be with us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name.